Let's get more now on the government's decision to approve fracking for shale gas at a site in Lancashire. It means that for the first time UK shale rock will be fracked horizontally, which is expected to yield more gas, but protesters say it uses techniques that risk the environment because of the chemicals and the pressure used. Well, Lancashire County Council initially refused permission at both sites last year on grounds of noise and traffic impact, but the fracking firm Quadrilla appealed and can now frack for gas at their Preston New Road site at Little Plumpton. So, let's talk uh, via webcam to Professor Ernest Rutter, who's Professor of Structural Geology at the University of Manchester, was part of the task force on shale gas. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, uh, Professor. Perhaps you could explain to those people who, who don't know exactly what it is, what horizontal mm. fracking means exactly. Uh, well, it's, uh, it, it, it doesn't mean that the fracking is particularly horizontal. It just means that the borehole from which the fracks are made to propagate is horizontal. Now, the development of horizontal drilling was the most important single factor in being able to exploit shale gas. Uh, we've had fracking with us for many, many years, and the combination of the two things together allows you to exploit this stuff. So what happens is that a vertical borehole at the depth of interest is deviated horizontally so that instead of penetrating very quickly through the shale bed which might only be a, a few tens of meters thick it's deviated horizontally so it runs along the shale bed which means that the borehole sees a lot more of the right kind of rock and then for it to see a bit more um, after, the, after the borehole has gone uh, two or three kilometers maybe um, it is uh, fractured uh, with, uh, with vertical cracks setting off from the horizontal borehole. And uh, about uh, 20 or 30 of these um, fractures are made to propagate into the rock at intervals of a few tens of meters. And they propagate laterally uh, a, a couple of hundred meters each way and uh, vertically uh, by a few tens of meters. And I guess that's what people are calling horizontal fracking, but that is an essential part of being able successfully to exploit uh, gas from shale. And a very good explanation of it, but, but it is, of course, controversial, isn't it, as you know? And protesters say that the, precisely those techniques you've just been outlining are a risk to the environment because of the pressure used, because of the chemicals used, uh, and the impact on the environment, the noise and so on. What, what do you say to that? Well, I don't think there's a great deal of a risk to the environment because the Environment Agency, for example, in this country have to approve uh, the plans put forward by um, any company wishing to use hydraulic fracturing to exploit shale gas. The shale gas is exploited from a depth of about three kilometres. That's quite a long way down. And it has to be that deep because uh, the, the pressure of the, over, the weight of the overlying rocks allows the gas to be preserved at high pressure, which means there's more gas trapped in the rock. Now, um, high pressures which are, which are used to uh, induce hydraulic fractures are nothing new. Hydraulic fracturing has been with us since 1947. And on this planet, about six million hydraulic fracking operations have been carried out since then. It's an essential part, for example, of geothermal energy uh, extraction. Uh, and it's quite possible that in the future it may need to be used in this way. Uh, it's uh, next to impossible for the fluids used for fracking to, uh, to pollute the surface, except accidentally at the surface, by spillage. Uh, what's uh, the most important um, way in which you can um, produce a kind of environmental pollution is by uh, a poor cement job on, on, on a casing, on a well casing, which allows gas to, es to escape from the well and to escape to the atmosphere. But it's very, very difficult to pollute the near surface with the fluids which are used for fracking or indeed the flowback fluids which are, are natural fluids which have to be handled in, in, in conventional oil, oil production anyway. What, what about people's worry that fracking can, can lead to earth tremors? Well, if you inject fluids into the earth uh, under pressure, there's always the possibility that you can set off an earth tremor. Now, most of the earth tremors which can be produced in connection with hydraulic fracturing are expected to be small, usually much less than a magnitude of three. Now, that is very small. It can, it'll not be felt by many people. It's, a, it's rather comparable to a truck driving by outside at the very most. The way in which you can produce um, more substantial earth tremors is the injection of fluids for waste disposal. For example, we have been seeing 
in recent years that in Oklahoma, Oklahoma have now become the earthquake capital of the United States because um, it, it's used as a place for the disposal of uh, various kinds of industrial fluids, in, including, including drilling and, and fracking wastes. And uh, they've been setting off quite a number of uh, earth tremors in that way. But of course, that has triggered a lot of uh, attention by the United States Geological Survey, who carried out a lot of research recently to work out how to control the rate of injection, the maximum pressures used, and using uh, seismic monitoring on site to reduce the possibility of, of, uh, of, of inducing earth tremors. So this is something which, with engineering, can be managed. All right. Well, uh, really good to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. Professor Ernest Rutter there, a Professor of Structural Geology at the University of Manchester. Thank you. Thank you. In a moment, we will have the latest business news with Ben. First, just a reminder of today's headlines. The UKIP MEP Stephen Wolfe says he is feeling better. He's in hospital following an altercation at a party meeting in Strasbourg this morning. Fracking at a site in northwest England has been given the go-ahead by the government and that overturns the decision of Lancashire County Council. And the extent of the devastation wrought by Hurricane Matthew in Haiti is becoming clearer. One town is said to have been all but wiped out. At least 65 people have died in Haiti. Hello, I'm Ben Thompson. These are the top business stories. Shares in the budget airline EasyJet have fallen sharply after the company said it expects profits for the year to have fallen by more than 25%. It will be the first fall in EasyJet's full-year profits since 2009. Shares in Twitter have fallen sharply ahead of trade in the United States on rumours that neither Google nor Disney will buy the social networking site. Shares are currently down more than 16%. And research seen by the BBC suggests Heathrow Airport could build a new runway without breaking European pollution laws. The independent study from Cambridge University says that as new, cleaner vehicle engines become more common, pollution levels should fall. That would compensate for any increase in emissions from an expanded Heathrow Airport. Good afternoon. Three of the world's largest economic bodies are coming together today to demand a more inclusive uh, system of free trade. Uh, that's in the face of growing international backlash and fears over increasing levels of inequality. Well, the World Trade Organization, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund are meeting in Washington today. They're expected to agree a new push to convince the public that globalization is good for growth. Well, today the BBC is looking at that issue of unfair trade and looking at who's gained and who's been left behind by ever-expanding trade links. Well, one expert told me that the global trade gap is widening. There is a, a perception that low-skilled workers in particular have lost out um, as uh, global trade has allowed the offshoring of a lot of uh, productive processes. So that's one of the problems. Um, another problem, of course, is that the very poorest countries in the world are not necessarily very well plugged into uh, various trading networks, right? Because a lot of production now gets done in, in uh, fragmented production chains, so-called global value chains, and a lot of countries are, are not able to participate very, uh, very fully in those. Um, so it's fair to say that, you know, the the gains of trade are still unevenly distributed, um, uh, both within countries um, uh, and uh, between countries. So let's speak to Ali Renison, who's head of Europe and trade policy at the Institute of Directors. She's in the newsroom for us. So, Ali, good to see you. Um, I, I don't know if you could hear that clip, but really they're outlining some of the issues as far as the countries that have been left behind in that global trade race, those that aren't uh, actively part of it. And that's the issue, because we take global trade for granted, but there are some areas of the world where, frankly, they're not part of the deal and therefore they do get left by the wayside. Yeah, and I think actually that's one of the most important arguments to say why we need to make sure we advance the process of liberalizing trade at both the regional and bilateral level, but also on a multilateral level to make sure that those developing countries are benefiting from it as well. What are those changes that need to be made? Because it's very easy for, for the big organizations like the World Trade Organization, the IMF and the World Bank to say, look, we need to open this up, we need to make the system fairer. But how does that manifest itself day to day? 
I think on, on a practical level, the only way that we're really going to get there in the absence of another big trade agreement at the multilateral level, we haven't had one in two decades really, um, is to do it at the regional and bilateral level. And I think one of the things that the UK, once it's left the EU, can do is try and adopt a much fairer sort of approach to um, trading with developing countries. And what would that look like? Is that simply new trade deals, it's agreements on tariffs, it's all that sort of thing? Or is it just, frankly, an opening up of markets to let anybody compete in any country? Because protectionism is still a big problem. Well, it's, it's growing like never before protectionism, whether we look at sort of what Donald Trump's economic policies would be, very reactionary, very defensive to countries like China, or the sort of antipathy and opposition to trade deals like the one being negotiated between the US and the EU. Um, if we look at, for example, countries in Africa, there's still a lot of closed access in terms of their ability to export to countries like the UK. Um, and one of the things that you would hope to do once we've left the EU is to be able to approach trade policy with those to allow them to export much more quickly. Mm, how easy is it going to be to come up with those trade deals? We've heard all this evidence that the UK doesn't have enough trade negotiators, that it could take years to come up with, with agreements with countries like India. Is it really that difficult? Uh, it depends on which countries you're looking at. If we look at India, for example, um, the EU has actually been in the middle and stuck really negotiating a trade deal with India, um, precisely because I think India wants to accompany with the, the, the trade agreement um, labor mobility uh, in skilled areas, not just in unskilled areas. Um, and, for example, the EU and presumably the UK would also want to try and get India to open up its very protected legal insurance market, which would be a big boost to the UK. Um, but I think that, you know, when we talk about the challenges, there are things that we can do to start to try and put some of the building blocks of what our trade policy will look like in place now so that by the time we've actually formally left the EU, okay. we'll be sort of some headway along. Ali, it's really good to talk to you, Ali Renison there, talking us through some of the issues affecting global trade. And remember, there is much more on our website about this, the special coverage of the BBC today, uh, about the impact of globalisation and trade. bbc.co.uk forward slash business is the place to find it. There's a whole load of stories there for you to take a look at. Uh, a look at some of the other stories for you today in the business world because the Chancellor, Philip Hammond, he's in the United States meeting with Wall Street's power brokers. He'll pledge that London's plans to keep its position as the world's leading financial centre. But many of the big US investment banks have big operations in the UK. They're worried about the effect of Brexit. Elsewhere, Samsung has stepped up its focus on artificial intelligence. It's bought the company called Viv. Uh, it's a digital assistant developed by the creators of Apple's Siri. Well, this week, you'll know Google launched its new Pixel phone, and that's using a lot of AI, the digital assistance function, so you can operate all sorts of things around the house. And the hourly output of British workers has finally reached where it was before the financial crisis. But, and it's a big but, productivity in the UK is still 18% below the average for the rest of the G7 advanced economy. So still a lot of work to do there. Let's have a look at the numbers because I want to show you what's happening on the currencies because this is the issue. Two big concerns, another fall in sterling down at $1.26 and a big question about whether the pound euro could reach parity. A pound buying you a euro, that would be a big concern. More later. See you then. Thanks very much, Ben. Thank you. See you later. Uh, time for a look at the weather now. Sarah Keith Lucas has got the details. Hiya. Hi there, Ben. Well, it's a little bit grey out there across many parts of the country. There is some late sunshine to be seen as we head through the remainder of the afternoon. But things are a little bit cooler than they have been. That's down to the fact that we've got a big area of high pressure up across Scandinavia. And we're drawing in an easterly breeze to the south of that. So temperatures in Poland, for instance, only around 7 degrees or so. And we're importing that cooler air towards our shores. That easterly flow also bringing with it a fair amount of cloud, picking up moisture from the North Sea. And the cloud thick enough through this evening and overnight for some spots of drizzly rain around too. It won't be quite as chilly as it has been over recent nights, with most of us in double figures. A fresh start to the day, though, across the north of Scotland, where we've got clearer skies. So here, with single figures, we're expecting a, a touch of frost. Scattered showers tomorrow morning across parts of Northern Ireland into Wales as well. Down the spine of England, we will have a few showers. So a fairly grey picture wherever you are during the morning hours, and just a few spits and spots of rain around. A little bit of brightness too, glimpsing through that cloud at times. And for most of us, temperatures around about 11 or 12 first thing in the morning. But they're not going to be rising all that quickly through the day, down to the fact that we've got a lot of cloud, particularly in the east, where we're seeing that breeze coming in, bringing with it some showers. The best of any sunshine will be for sheltered parts of the north and west, for instance, western Scotland, northwest England, western Wales too. Temperatures generally around 13 to 17 degrees or so.
as we end Friday and head into the weekend, no great change. It's a game of spot the difference. Still high pressure, keeping things mainly settled and rather cloudy with some light outbreaks of rain here and there. But again, many places staying predominantly dry. So this is how Saturday is shaping up. Bit of a cloudy start. Many places having a dry day and there will be some sunshine breaking through the cloud, particularly for sheltered western areas. Rather more breezy than it has been across East Anglia and the southeast, and on that breeze, a few scattered showers too. And temperatures similar to today, really, around about 13 to 17 degrees. Similar once again for Sunday, a lot of dry and fairly bright weather, particularly in the west. Cooler where you're exposed to that eastern uh, breeze and some scattered showers towards the southeast. Now let's cast our eye towards the other side of the Atlantic. This is Hurricane Matthew. It's barreling right across the Bahamas at the moment, heading its way gradually northwestwards over the next few days. So we're likely to see this storm moving very close to the coast of Florida and up towards the Carolinas. Then it is likely to eventually move back out into the Atlantic. But it's something we're keeping a very close eye on and there are more details on Hurricane Matthew on our website. This is BBC News, I'm Ben Brown, the headlines at four. The UKIP leadership contender Stephen Wolfe is recovering in hospital this afternoon after an altercation at a party meeting in the European Parliament. The government has been given the go-ahead to allow fracking for shale gas at a site in the northwest of England. A 41-year-old man who accused of murdering four young men he met online went to prison for lying about the first death a court has heard.